Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design. Many thanks for joining us today. We're really excited to be joined today by Dr. Giacomo Savani. He's an academic, a podcaster, and also an artist. Uh, he received his PhD in Roman archaeology um, from the University of Leicester with a thesis on the role of private baths in the process of cultural change promoted by Rome in Britain. He's currently transforming his thesis into the monograph, Rural Baths and Bathing, Sensorial Exchanges in the Countryside of Roman Britain, which I can't wait. It's going to be published by Routledge um, in spring next year, 2023. I've also just heard that he's um, going up to St Andrews uh, now. <laughs> um, he's the, at the Royal Society of Edinburgh Saltire, early career fellow at the School of Classics there at the University of St Andrews. So um, congratulations, Giacomo, and, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, Vanessa. That's lovely. Well, um, we get, we've got you on the on the podcast today to talk about ancient Roman bathing, uh, nature, and healing. And um, obviously, this is about the journal. This is the journal of biophilic design, and so we're looking at how ancient practices can also influence and inspire biophilic design today. So we're going to also look about how we might adapt this ancient practice into our own healthcare and spaces of healing. So I'm really looking forward to exploring some uh, suggestions. So before we go anywhere else, <laughs> Giacomo, can you um, tell us about yourself, uh, what you do and also what your specialism is, please? Of course, so uh, I'm, a I'm a Roman archeologist. I work mainly on um, Roman social, social and cultural history, ancient environments and the reception of antiquity in early modern Europe. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm particularly interested in ancient bath and bathing. Uh, balneology as well. So focusing on the reception of bathing and bath in Renaissance Italy and 18th century England, but also in ancient, in, ancient, uh, in the ancient times. Uh, so as you say, I just started a new postdoc uh, as a Royal Society of Edinburgh Saltire Early Career Fellow at the School of Classics, University of St. Andrews. It's a very long title, I know. And the project is going to be about uh, women and the bath in ancient medicine. So it's going to explore the role of bath and uh, bathing in ancient uh, gynecological texts and their influence on Renaissance uh, treaties. So basically I'm interested in how bath um, were used to cure the female body. And, um, and this is interesting because it's one of the earliest at attempts to create gender specific medical knowledge. Uh, as you say, I'm also a visual, visual artist and I recently collaborated with the novelist Victoria Thompson to explore the impact of uh, imagination in art, the impact that this, 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 sorry, the impact that imagination in art can have on archaeological research. Fantastic. I, I look forward to um, looking more at, at that. Um, I'm going to put links on the website, uh, on the website, and on the the blurb that goes with the, the each podcast. Um, links to your art and and also your research and and um, your academic um, links as well. So. Um, I've got to ask you, what got you into um, ancient balneology? Um, I mean, obviously, I know what balneology is, you know, from the Greek term, but can maybe can you explain um, to our listeners um, what it, what the term means as well? And also, and what excites you about it, please? <laughs> sure. So balneology is the study of hot and mineral springs and the therapeutic effects of bathing. Um, I use this term in a slightly broader sense that kind of overlaps with hydrotherapy. So this is because ancient sources uh, do not always distinguish between um, the use of thermal and normal water uh, for treatment. So in antiquity, bathing uh, took place in many forms and settings in response to religious, therapeutic, hygienic, and recreational needs. And I guess it's the complexity of this phenomenon that really attracted me in the first place. Um, my first contact with ancient bath happened back in uh, uh, 2009. I was uh, still a master's student and I was working with the, Pompe uh, sorry, the Vesuviana project um, of the University of Bologna. So we were recording the rooms of the Casa del Centenario, a massive residential complex in Pompeii. So my dissertation was about the bath of this building. And I guess it was kind of love at first sight. 
Uh, so then my PhD was about the social function of rural bath in Roman Britain, as you mentioned, uh, focusing on the bath built near villa sites. And uh, now that I'm transforming this into a book for Routledge, I'm adding this sensory element, which I think is crucial. I mean, we're going to talk about it in more detail later on, but Roman baths were very much sensorial spaces where bathers engage in a deeply synesthetic experience. So all the senses were involved. And this is the kind of experience that I'm trying to reconstruct in the book. After the PhD, I got interested in the rediscovery of Roman bath. So how antiquarians and architects look at these buildings from the 15th century onwards. Um, this was the topic of my Irish Research Council project at the University College Dublin, which I just completed. And uh, while I was researching for this project, I realized the importance of medicine in the reception of ancient bath. And so I started investigating this aspect and I noticed that ancient medical treaties tend to emphasize the positive response of the female body to this kind of treatment. And so the current project, Women and the Bath in Ancient Medicines, aims to investigate this gender specific approach. And this approach is really an exception. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, 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 an innovation really, especially if you consider the widespread gender bias still affecting medical curricula today. So the focus is still very much on the male body and this affects the quality of healthcare experienced by female patients. As you say, you know, sort of you're focusing on how um, balneology, how, you, how hydrotherapy and all this thing, how it affects women as well. You know, um, that, that's I'd, I'd be interesting to read, to read that when that comes out. And obviously we can explore that a little bit further. Um, maybe for people who are a bit unsure what Roman baths looked like. Um, I mean, some people may have been to um, Bath in, in, in Britain, or they might have been to some other ones or, rem, you know, remnants, <laughs> some very sort of like broken down remains at different places when they've been on holiday, maybe. Um, but maybe you could explain a little bit about what they look like um, and then also what happened there. Maybe you could describe one to us or something. Of course, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I would say that the, the bath were really essential facilities in antiquity. We find them in cities, small towns, military outposts, villas, everywhere. And uh, the love for bathing in the Roman world was shared by people with very different social and cultural backgrounds. And I always like to cite a funeral inscription from Rome dating to the first century AD, where we read that bath, together with wine and sex, ruin our bodies, but at the same time, there are the pleasures that become vacuum, so make life worth living. Um, and so, as I say, baths were used for uh, all kinds of different purposes by different people. Although the main distinction was between natural thermal bath and man-built bath. Among the latter, you have public bath, private bath, built inside a house, for instance, and bath associated with religious sites. This usually had uh, healing properties and were built near thermal, thermal springs, like the complex of Bath in England, which is dedicated to uh, Sulis Minerva. Um, so if we want to take an, ex um, so we, if we consider an example of a Roman bath, let's say, I would probably choose a public bathhouse, but not one of the massive imperial bath in Rome. Uh, more think I'm thinking more about a medium size set of bath, like the Stabian bath in Pompeii. So the structure were designed to allow, to allow the bather to progress through a sequence of spaces with different temperatures. Before starting the, the bathing process proper, the customer was anointed with oils and did some exercise, usually ball games. And then he started the, this rather complex ritual that bathing entailed. Uh, so they would probably start from the warm room, progress to the hottest room, and then back through the warm room to the cold room. Depending on the size of the building, uh, these rooms could have heated or cold pools, sometimes even sauna-like facilities and swimming pools. At some point during this process, the bather would scrub their skin with a strigil, a tool designed to remove oil, sweat, and dirt from the skin. And this had an elongated shape where it usually made of bronze, but we know also uh, strigil of other materials. So 
the full process requires a lot of time. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's not surprising that, you know, that a trip to the bath became a social event. Some of the earliest buildings, like the Stabian bath in Pompeii that I mentioned before, had two distinct sets of bath, one for women and one for men. However, mixed bathing was certainly practiced in antiquity. And uh, bathing wings for, for women are not common in the imperial period. So scholars are still debating about it, but we know for certain that ancient sources mention that Emperor Hadrian in the early second century AD banned mixed bathing. And that means that it was a widespread habit. Uh, anyway, it, it is likely that this practice varied from region, from, re from region to region and from establishment to establishment. And at the end, it was probably a matter of personal choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so obviously you said they spent a lot of time there. So they would, would go and like, I suppose, you know, shoot the breeze, talk of politics and, and all sorts of things. Do we know what they spoke about? Do we, do we have references in letters and, and things about what they chatted about or, you know, that they were meeting up with people to discuss anything? Well, uh, I don't know if we have specific references to what they were talking about, but gossiping was definitely big in the bath. And I think Marshall kind of mentioned this poet, um, Marshall mentions the, 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 the sort of very, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 this environment describes this environment as a very chatty place where people, yeah. you know, would discuss all the news from the city. And, and obviously, you know, in even more serious conversation took place there, you know, business talking, business meetings took place in the bar. So it, as I say, it was a real social center for the people living in a town or a city in Rome, whatever. It was a place where people went to, uh, to share, you know, their time with other people and communicate and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we could talk a little bit about the, um, the physical design of the buildings um, and also the external spaces of the ancient baths, you know, obviously that made them ideal spaces for health and for healing. I mean, you've described um, a, a bath in the city, but, you know, I know we've just, I discussed with Dr. Patty Baker before about the, um, the Esclopean and, and being outside and, and sort of nature and how nature plays. I mean, maybe you can um, sort of give us a kind of idea of like just a bit about the physical design of, may, of maybe both or, or one or the other, please. Yeah, sure. So um, so I would say, first of all, that the opposition open and closed space play a very important role in the design of these buildings, uh, especially public bath. Uh, so before starting the bathing process, as I say, you would probably want to do some light exercise. Um, so many bathhouses feature a palestra, which is a training facility. And it was usually a rectangular open court surrounded by colonnades and with adjoining rooms. And this structure works fine in the Mediterranean area, uh, Mediterranean countries, but in cold provinces like Britain, for instance, palestra were soon abandoned <laughs> and substituted with basilicae, which, uh, which were halls where people could exercise shelter from bad weather. Anyway, in Southern Europe, definitely bathers move from the palestra's large open space to cold, warm and hot rooms. And, uh, and the hot rooms could be relatively small, like cozy spaces with, hot ceiling, with low ceiling to prevent heat dissipation. And I guess the process of entering a nice and warm space especially in winter, was very appealing in antiquity, uh, when very few houses had effective heating systems. Uh, but if we want to talk a little bit more about, you know, this uh, religious side, uh, I would say that, again, there, and I'm going to discuss this maybe a little bit more in detail later, but, you know, the relationship with nature was kind of um, fascinating to reconstruct there, because you had, you know, the human intervention was very um, visible, very strong, so that kind of the Romans like to tame their environment before engaging them with them in a sense. And I guess, you know, with this, uh, with this religious sites associated with springs, uh, thermal springs, you know, nature definitely play a role, but it was somehow uh, mitigated by the, the human intervention, transformed by human intervention. And so I, I guess, you know, the, 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 the architectural elements, you know, the, the capacity to integrate nature and a built environment 
was crucial to make you know, that connection, to maintain that connection between the users of the bar and um, the sense of place, you know, the, 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 the deities living there and the kind of uh, the environment that was surrounding them and giving them that possibility to heal. Okay, so um, so basically, the, the, sort of the, the it was like a gym. You'd have a gym first of all, like we have when we go to a spa hotel. We have like a gym. We go and we go and work out, and then we go and sort of throw ourselves in the pool, and we go into the steam room. We go into the sauna, and we go back to the steam room. Then we kind of chill out for a bit, go and have like a little shower thing, freezing cold one, or then we warm up again slightly. So it's the same kind of principle. Um, and but obviously they had the the heated underfloor system, the hypercore system to heat it up, and um, so the sort of technology they had to heat these these bars as well was really fascinating. Um, I find it interesting that you say that um, they kind of tamed nature, or what exactly did you say tamed? I think the word you you kind of like anchored on there was was transformed nature, and I think that's really what what we're doing now, really in, in biophilic design is that we're trying to incorporate nature and the best of nature into our built environment so that it really creates these beautiful environments or happy environments, healthy environments and positive environments uh, for us so that we do have that, we do maintain that connection with nature, but but it's, it's like on our own terms, but we take the best of it. So, um, so is that what you're saying? It's kind of, that's what the Romans did in their architectural design of these bathhouses. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say that really, you know, as I said, they had a mixed relationship with nature and antiquity. So they, they, they perceive it as a overwhelming and unpredictable force. On uh -huh. uh, but on the, on the other hand, while places were imbued with religious connotation, okay, so they could be dangerous, but they had that spiritual element that was very important. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I think that the process was exactly what you described. So trying to maintain the, um, the positive, spiritual, and also uh, healing elements of, a, of an environment, um, but transforming it in a way that is accessible and safe for the humans to use. Basically. Okay. Um, and you, you spoke earlier about the sensory side of things and how that's really, really important in all of this. Um, and obviously in biophilic design, we're always discussing senses and all our senses and how we need to um, create environments that sort of engage them and, but, but obviously the optimum level kind of thing. Um, I mean, how can you, can you explain how these ancient baths and these, these um, spaces kind of excited the senses or, or helped or heal or, you know, how, how did it, how did the senses respond to it? I mean, can you explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. So the senses, as I say, play a crucial role in ancient bathing. Uh, this where, you know, bathing was a very much a, a synesthetic experience that, that will involve all the senses at the same time. So for instance, sight will have been stimulated by the decoration of the wall paintings, the, the mosaics, and the body uh, might have reacted to the temperature variations. Uh, there was a tactile perception of increasing humidity on the wet surfaces of the rooms, the scent of aromatic oils and the bubbling of the water that accompany conversation and consumption of food. And the, the aura of luxury and sensuality associated with this building was already praised by classical authors like Marshall that I already mentioned and continued to intrigue artists well after the fall of the Roman Empire. So to give you a glimpse of this complex sensory space, I would like to read a brief passage from a book I published in 2018 with my colleagues Sarah Scott and Matthew Morris. The book is entitled Life in the Roman World, Roman Leicester, and is one of the outcomes of the archaeology and classics in the community project at the University of Leicester. The project tried to develop a sustainable school and community engagement program based on academic research. So in the book, I wrote the narrative and created this illustration for, um, for to, to actually convey some of this academic research. So, and then this narrative and art are combined with a synthesis of research on Roman Leicester. Uh, the narrative is written from the perspective of a, a local god, Magalus, uh, and he observes everyday life in the city. And the passage I'm going to read is taken from chapter five, where the god pays a visit to the large bath of Leicester 
built under the enter Hadrian. So here it goes. I walk into a large hall full of columns, marbles, statues, naked people too, soaking, swimming, chatting, drinking, and masseurs, ball players, dancers, sellers, thieves, the entire city in one building. The more I proceed, the more the air gets heavy and thick with smells. Smells of bodies, cheap food, perfume oils, and exotic unguents, all blending into the sweet stench of stagnant water. And the noise, a thunder of splashes, cries, calls, and gargles, filling every room and ear. I probe the water gushing from the mouth of a silverfish. It's hot like blood. I can feel the heat rising under my feet. I get into the last room so steaming that the walls are covering moisture. I plunge into the pool. Water embraces me like she has never done before. Fire has changed her, transforming her into a heavy, suggestive substance. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I mean, what a, what a um, sensorial experience you've co conveyed there. That's that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to have to replay that again. There's a picture of going, you have to hold the book up again and, and read the, can you read the title out? So it yeah, comes. so it's a life in the Roman world, Roman Lester. And uh, as I say, it's, I, I wrote the narrative and I made the illustration for the book. And uh, it's me and uh, Sarah Scott and Matthew Morris. So. Okay, lovely. Thank you. I'm going to put a link on there on the website for that as well. So um, that looks really interesting. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. This really conjured how it must have looked and smelt and felt and the sounds and, and everything. So as you say, a real sense, you know, real sensory experience. Um, obviously, nature features um, very prominently in, um, in ancient environments and um, obviously, especially in places of health and healing. Uh, can you explain how nature played a role in ancient bathing practices? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, so we, we already discussed a bit this, the, the fact that they had, the Romans had a bit of a mixed relationship with nature. So um, I would probably talk a little bit more about um, bath associated with sanctuaries, uh, like the hot springs of bath. But because of their sacred nature, these places require careful architectural interventions. And one of my favorite sites is, a, is this large bathhouse that was discovered in, 1970, in the 1970s um, at Ebrington in Gloucestershire in the UK. And it was built near a small brook known as the Grove. And the builders carefully planned the flow of the bath drain to prevent that the used water could contaminate the nearby brook. And because of this, some scholars believe that the bath were part of a shrine dedicated to the spring's deities. Interestingly, the water was probably conducted into this set of bath through a small trickling cascade, which certainly added a further sensory element to the bather's experience. So you have here a very nice example of two elements. So on, on the one hand, you, the builders try to prevent the contamination of the brook nearby. And on the other hand, they, they were able to use the water to actually um, produce a soothing and calming effect on the, on the bathers through this, through this cascade. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you're, if you're interested, actually, we, 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 about the, the relationship with Romans and ancient environment, uh, you can check the podcast, The Sustainable Past, I created with my colleague, Patty Baker. And obviously, we will soon release a new season which include a great conversation with Vanessa. <laughs> so you can check that out too. <laughs> That's lovely, thank you. And I really enjoyed chatting to you on that podcast. It is really very good. If people are interested in the ancient world, um, then I, I, I do recommend you check it out. Again, I'll put the link on the um, on the blurb that accompanies the podcast. Um, I just wanna just, just circle back just a tiny bit, just a very, very tiny bit. Um, you touched on the decoration of the ancient baths. Um, I mean, I, I kind of understand obviously there was mosaics and, and I know there were wall paintings and things like that, but can you describe some of the, the designs, you know, some of the, <clears throat> the themes um, that were there 
Um, and I, th I believe they were like, you know, sort of dolphins and, and fishes and things. But can you, I mean, I, I believe there's lots of natural world imagery um, there. Could you, could you maybe sort of explore that a little bit for us? Yeah, please? absolutely. So um, marine, marine scenes were extremely common, obviously, for obvious reasons. And uh, you have, you know, all these sea creatures and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, deities associated with water and the sea, of course. But if we, I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the Bath of the Casa del Centenario in Pompeii now, because it's just uh, something that <laughs> I'm very familiar with. And in there, you have, of course, all these kind of um, sea-related uh, episodes, uh, scenes in the, in the, in the, inside the buildings. But the frigidarium of this structure is actually an open space. And uh, in there, you have um, a kind of, you know, kind of traditional decoration on the walls, like, you know, with nothing specifically um, to do with the bath. But then when you, when you get in closer to the pool, you see there that they, they, they recreated a natural environment around the pool. So they painted, you know, uh, trees and, and, and bushes and, and, and all these natural elements that kind of go very well with the experience of bathing in a, in, in, a, in a pool there. So again, you know, that connection with nature was very strong. So that, that, that being surrounded by, by, by these trees would have given the impression to the bather to be in a natural pool. And would have probably, you know, stimulated thought about nature and, you know, would have just uh, helped them to relax and enjoy their experience. Yeah, it adds it's like the sort of very similitude, isn't it? It's kind of like to encourage what it, you know, to create that you're not outside, but, you know, you're creating that sort of visual trick, as it were, you know, creating this sort of virtual nature wall, really, and nature and natural elements. Um, so, yeah, so it must have been a wonderful experience to come from inside and feel like, cause obviously, you're in a town, aren't you? In It's Pompeii, you said that one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's, yeah, so it's not by the sea, it's not by that, but you're actually in a town, so, and it was very busy and noisy, wasn't it, Pompeii? It was a very, very popular city, a very affluent city as well, so you can imagine um, all that. So having, going to the bars and, and just having some downtime, so it's like a spa, really, um, I suppose. Um, that's really cool. Um, obviously, you've written as well and researched about how the reception of um, ancient Roman bathing through the through the ages kind of thing, but you specialize in the in the 18th century, is that right? Um, I mean, can you explain a little bit about that and sort of what happened, how they how they came across the sort of, you know, the the ancient baths and, and what is that, how that felt, you know, how that sort of manifested itself in the 18th century, please. Of course, yeah. So uh, we start from the Renaissance just briefly. So because the monument, you know, these monumental ruins of, of Roman baths spark the imagination of artists, architects, and antiquarians. And at the same time, as I say, physicians were reading ancient medical treaties and debate the benefit of cold and cough bath. And the process of rediscovery of Roman bath was a bit slower in Britain, and where we have more detailed records only from the early 18th century. And the establishment of the Society of Antiquaries of London in 1718 was certainly an important turning point. One of the major discovery Discoveries happened in 1755 when, a remain, when the remains of a set of bath were unearthed in the city of Bath uh, during the demolition of a house. And writing about these buildings, the famous antiquarian William uh, Stiocoli uh, celebrates, and I'm quoting here, the incomparable invention of the hippocaust, so the, the underfloor heating system used by the Romans. And Stiocoli also praised the ancient habit of daily bathing and oiling, as he says and notes that this healthy routine was popular also in Roman Britain, as, testi as testified by, and I'm quoting again, the innumerable remains of hippocaus in our island. However, he admits that this practice was not reintroduced among the refined politeness of our age. <laughs> and, uh, and this is true, you know, I mean, it's true to a certain extent. Um, public baths were not a common amenity in Georgian England. However, the 18th century saw a significant revival of ancient balneology. I work specifically on a physician called John Floyer, uh, is one of the great supporters, supporters of the healing virtues of cold bathing. 
And his, in his books, Floyer encourages his patients to regain the ancient natural vigor, strength, and hardiness by a frequent use of cold bathing. And that was a quote again. So following this new trend, you actually see um, a lot of this structure appearing in uh, both, both townhouses and, and countryside villas. So this, this structure for cold bathing. Really. And Floyer himself built a bathhouse, a unit's well, near his own town in Litchfield. We have a description of this structure. And we know that there were two sets of bath, one for men and one for women and that the water was sufficiently deep to reach up to the, to the neck. So you could actually really swim in this structure, which is still there, I saw it, but it's, a, it's in a very poor state of preservation, unfortunately. I uh, would really love to actually bring it back to its former splendor. Um, so anyway, in the 18th century, clearly so a very specific kind of revival luncheon dating, uh, very peculiar form that was influenced by contemporary views that associated hot with debauchery and cold with moral integrity. Okay, so the cold bathing from the Roman period, they were kind of, they were, they were, they were, they were trying to push that because they thought that if morally it would be really good for us, you know, sort of like the heat would, would sort of obviously raise our, raise our, raise all our heart rates and kind of, <laughs> to sort of be, end up to, with debauchery, as you say. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, but that's interesting as well, the cold. I mean, there's a current revival here in the UK. I mean, it's really big, um, this wild swimming. Just swimming out in you know in pools and 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 rivers and and just being outside in nature and it's wonderful everybody's like really going for it and feeling invigorated and, and really amazing um you know and I, I know there's been lots of research and scientific studies on how it affects us and and sort of our brains and our minds and our health and our heart rates and all this kind of stuff but actually when you just talk to people i think i've got friends that do it and you know, they just they just feel amazing, and just you watch them transform, and you think, well, there must be something in this, you know, over and above the um, the scientific thing. So, um, you know, I, I kind of I, I I do it every now and again. I'll do it with a shower, or if I'm in a you know hotel or a spa, or whatever, and I can turn the thing down to freezing, and then I try not to scream if I'm obviously in a public place, <laughs> which obviously must have happened. Can you imagine that must have happened when people jumped into the cold bath? They must have screamed, and there must have been. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that that happened, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like it's a natural human um, reaction, isn't it? Um, if people wanted to get um, a feel for an ancient Roman bath, I mean, you mentioned the place in Litchfield, which is obviously knackered, so he won't send people there. Um, but is there somewhere where they could go where you would encourage people to kind of get a feel of what an ancient bath would have looked like um, at all? Yeah, sure. I mean, Bath is obviously an incredible site, so I would definitely recommend to pay a visit. Uh, you can see really the stratigraphy of this site, and you know, from the Roman time, times to the to the modern period. And it's really impressive to think that uh, until recently, people kept bathing in the same pools used by by the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, another beautiful beautiful site that I know of is um, Hammam Esalihini. Hopefully, I pronounced it correctly. Is in Algeria. And again, a very well-preserved Roman bath, still in use today. So if you happen to be there, just go in and check it out. It was called Aqua Flaviana in antiquity. And uh, apparently the, 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 the Arabic name means something like the bath of the righteous. Um, to get a feel of, of an ancient bath in the UK, um, I would probably recommend trying the bath at Arrogate, which is, Arrogate is actually very close to where I live in Leeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were built in the late 19th century and were inspired, inspired by ancient bar. So the complex has a frigidarium, the cold room, the tepidarium, the warm room, and the caldarium, the hot room. It's a very nice arrangement. And uh, I was there, I think, in 2018. And it was just a really great experience. I really enjoyed it. And it made me, it made me really appreciate even more the role, the importance of the senses in ancient bathing. Wow, okay. I didn't know about that one. I didn't know <laughs> yeah, about that one. Harrogate, very special place. <laughs> Har Harrogate. So I just I know they do toffee, I think, because my kind of <laughs> so um okay. Um so I, I shall I'm I'm gonna make a make a date with myself and, and go up there and um and, and have a have a listen. Have a listen, have a I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that actually. <laughs> I haven't listened at all. <laughs> I listen to the bath, bubbling. <laughs> I listen to the bath. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, so so Harrogate, I kind of uh, I'll definitely go and have a, have a visit for. Um, just before I come on to the very final question um, about you know the magic brush of biophilia that I ask everybody, I just wanted just off off piece. I mean, is it is there something? If you were, you know, if you were going to sort of create this sort of a, um, aspects or pick up aspects from the, all the all the knowledge that you know, all the aspects of um, ancient bars, balneology, the senses, the hot, the cold, the wall paintings, all those kind of different aspects. What what are, what particular aspects would you recommend if if there was like an an interior designer or an architect or somebody who's listening to the podcast right now who wanted to recreate something with you know with their biophonic design hat on for healthcare maybe for a healthcare place um or, or for, you know you know so where where people could go to kind of really feel the optimum benefit of what the romans did in their bathhouses what would you what would you recommend out out of all the things that you um that you know so I would probably say that you know the 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 reaction to of the body to the change in temperature is definitely something really powerful, and I think that element should be emphasized. Um, you know, moving. I mean, from personal experience, you know, moving from cold to warm to hot is actually a really apart from the fact that it's very reinvigorating, but it's also it's a good feeling. It makes you feel better mentally too, and uh, and I guess that's something that really the Romans understood you know the fact that it was good for your body it was good for your mind and uh, and, I, and this is something special I, I i find the the idea you know of a beautiful healing and warm place accessible to everybody because really the ancient baths were mostly free uh or they, they they were kind of you know not very expensive to enter in and you know having that kind of space in a in a city is just very inspiring you know something that we should consider reintroducing i think yeah Okay, lovely. Thank you. That's really nice. Um, and I just, and somebody has posed in the final question that I ask everybody on these podcasts, though, so regular listeners will know. And I think this is probably one of my favorite bits of every podcast. <laughs> um, but if you could paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia, what would it look like? <laughs> so I'm not going to be very original. So I would say that a world full of public bath definitely is a, is, a, is a special place. You know, people could go enter for free, spend time there together, uh, you know, from away from the cold in winter and from the heat in summer. It's, uh, and there, you, you know, these places where, uh, you know, these places could, could reconnect us to water uh, through biophilic design and architecture. And, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, it's very special because the senses could become once again you know, a gateway to for our to our well-being, which is something that you know we tend to forget nowadays. You know, we tend to um, underestimate the power, the the, the 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 capacity that the senses have to actually make us feel better and cure us in a way. So yeah, I think that's definitely something that I I would uh, you know, and I, and I think in general the idea of having a place, you know. In, a, in the center of a city where people could go. You know, obviously we have, you know, um, gyms and wellness centers, but this is difficult. This, this is different because, you know, these were very accessible and social spaces where, you know, really people went to, to, to chat as well as just getting better. So I think that's the, the key. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.